Thank you very much for joining us and for staying with us here on TV3 and 3FM. You can also catch us on DSTV279 and at 3news.com. Now, today we're talking about the GMPC Acre deal. We'll be looking at all the issues, the nuances, and bring to light the key issues in the debate. And this has been going on for quite a while, almost a month. But um, we can now take a deep dive into it. Now, this deal came about because of a request made by the Ministry of Energy to Parliament for GMPC to acquire stake in the deep water uh, tunnel Cape Three Points and the South Deep Water Tunnel for some $1.6 billion. And this is from Acre Energy and AGM separately because there are two fields. You talk about the Pecan field, which is the Acre Energy field, and then you can also refer to the Nyankom field, which is the AGM field. And this has debated, led to a fierce debate, lots of controversy about the spirit and the intention behind uh, this deal. So civil society has waded into it and has been very strong in opposition to this. But there have been others who support the deal for a number of reasons, and we'll get into that. So this morning, that's what we'll be dealing with. And so I welcome in studio uh, Ben Boachi, Executive Director of ASAP. Ben, good morning. Great. Good to see you. Thank you. And also via Zoom, we welcome Dr. Yusuf Suleimana who is also an energy analyst. Thank you, Dr. Suleimana, for joining us. Good morning. All right. Thank you. So let's talk a bit about this deal. I'll start off with uh, Ben. So there's been a lot of criticism about borrowing some $1.6 for this deal. And the view is that it's to buy a 37% stake in the Peckham field and a 70% stake in the Nyankom field. First, is this price exaggerated for the two fields? Yeah, uh, thank you very much once again, Jifa, for uh, having me here. And um, I think, I mean, civil society has been frontal with our uh, understanding of the transaction as is. And like you did indicate, we haven't had you know, enough response uh, from GNPC until recently where we saw the um, uh, chief executive mount some media platforms to try and you know do some damage control if you like and from what we are seeing him do we are seeing um, a deliberate smear campaign against civil society who have criticized the transaction with specific details and he's evading that and focusing on some tangential issues that are not so important uh, to the conversation. His claim that, I mean, if we acknowledge he's available to engage, it's not accurate. He's never been available. The corporation has never been available. And I'm sure you would have tried. I have tried. To I get must GMPC admit. to the studio. Yes. They have never been available uh, to engage. The ones that they tried to engage, uh, we punched into the analysis and we asked for a conversation with the corporation itself when they brought in the uh, Lambert people to engage us. And since then, we are still waiting uh, for that engagement. So the public outlook that GMPC has been available and civil society doesn't want to engage and we just want to criticize the corporation is inaccurate. They have not uh, been available. Um, we issued a statement cataloging issues with the transaction. And ordinarily, you would want to see the corporation respond to us. You know what they did? They rather responded to the Norwegian Embassy, to Parliament, and to the IMF because we copied them. All right. So where is the engagement from their end? There hasn't been any engagement. And we also see another diversionary act of Mr. Kekes, Dr. Keke Sapon, you know, trying to rather tout his credentials to win public support uh, for this transaction. Uh, you know, talking about his role in Cocoa Board and how he helped syndicate loans, which has become a practice uh, today. I'm not sure we want to celebrate that as civil society. If he wants to draw our attention to his public life, we are happy to engage in that. But we have deliberately stayed on this conversation to ensure that we are dealing with the specifics and the subject matter. And that smear campaign, we will not engage in. I mean, he can invite us into that conversation. I'm not sure 
civil society will want to celebrate turning Cocoa Board into a debt procurement institution uh, for several decades. Recently, I was in the U.S. to learn about how cocoa is processed, all right, in a museum. And they had cocoa growing in the room to show people how cocoa thrives. That is the legacy you want to leave and not becoming a debt procurement enterprise. And I'm surprised that he leaves out other roles in public life, like being in tour. We are happy to get into all of those things, all right? And as much as possible, we want to stay with this conversation. And if he wants to stay there, we would dissect the issues, we will bring to perspective what the problems are with this particular transaction. We can even zoom deeper into his role in this GMPC and pick on many, many, many issues. But as civil society, we believe in the carrot and stick approach, where we encourage the corporation and try to encourage them to do what is right. And that is why we are not always frontal, you know, on some of the ills in, in the corporation. Okay, but and, and rather, I want to focus on okay. this. But let's focus, right. let's focus on this um, in terms of why this deal isn't the best deal at this time. And that's why I asked for the valuation of these blocks based on the offer. Is it exaggerated? I think that is the conclusion that we have come to. And I tell you what, you know, this is a, a transaction that has significant history. The blocks, they have a significant history to it. Um, the Hess block, um, which is the Deepwater Tunnel Cape 3 point, was um, managed by Hess uh, from 2006, all right, until 2014 when they decided to offload shares. Uh, and even before that, they had made discoveries. They had done 12 wells, um, seven discoveries, and five appraisal wells. And they dis decided to offload 50% of that um, to uh, government and to look oil and fuel trade. And we refused to buy our 10% that was allotted to us. So fuel trade and um, uh, 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 look oil bought their shares. Subsequent to that, they decided to leave and exit and sell the 50% rem remainder to Ake mm -hmm. at a cost of $100 million. So that is how much Ake paid for the stake in that block. And we do agree that subsequent to that, Ake has done some work. They have done three wells uh, subsequently to further appraise the well to be sure of what um, has left them. And you know, we are now being told that that three wells, all right, is costing us in excess of $500 million. And we are asking question, how? What I do know, though, Mr. Bwachi, is that to drill one well, it costs almost $100 million. So if they've drilled drill three, you, you are talking about $300 million, in addition to all other works that do come up. It is expensive, really. The oil and gas sector. Talo alone over the last 12 years has spent what? Almost uh, more than 10 billion on Jubilee, more than 8 billion on 10. And we, that's an average of a billion a year. We can come into those specifics. I mean, every well has its own challenges and its own peculiarities. And the average in Ghana is about $40 million per well, right? The, the, the most difficult well that we have seen uh, on the OCTP well which cost about $100 million, was even eventually, I think, abandoned. Mm -hmm. So it's not every well that costs that much. This is just an exploratory well. Yes. It hasn't even been appraised, mm -hmm. all right? Um, so uh, we can get to those specific, but we are asking the questions for answers. So you, so you the criticize, fundamental question so you, even is this. Just a quick one. So you criticize Acre's projection yeah. that they've spent close to $800 million on the work done in that field. The work done, and the, the numbers keep shifting. I mean, I'm hearing from Dr. Keke upon in recent conversation about how they spent the money and what their audit reviews. And they're even telling you that when they bought the blocks, the two blocks for about 150 million, um, their paperwork even cost around $30 million, <laughs> all right? And those are numbers that we have to interrogate. Those are numbers we have to question. How does registration and paperwork cost that much money? We have to interrogate that. How does ACA's operational cost beyond uh, uh, administrative cost you know, exceed $200 million for, 
from the audit that GMPC says it has done. We have to analyze that. For two years in Ghana, you can spend over 200 million on administrative costs. We have to interrogate that because it's not a full-fledged business where you're even producing, you have all the uh, uh, staff in place, you are building your own structures, you are renting. What is costing us 200? We want to interrogate those numbers mm -hmm. to be sure that the Ghanaian people are actually paying uh, for, uh, 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 for something you know, within the range of what the market would have offered would uh, you, uh, uh, for it. What would for you be a more realistic figure if you know, GMPC is to go into this deal uh, knowing fully well that there's something to, to be gained? What's a realistic figure? Now, you see, that is why we're saying that the market should determine the price. You see, when, when you say the market, you mean there should be a bid? Or? There should be a bid. And that is what Ake went to the market and got nobody to buy it. The market should determine it. Let the market, and interestingly, GMPC has the, the right of first refusal, first right of refusal. So if nobody wants it, or even somebody puts up a bid, GMPC can say, I can match the bid mm -hmm. and pick it. So why are you acting as the, the desperate one to okay. pay for any amount Let that uh, Ake is asking of mm -hmm. you at this point? Okay, so... Let me ask essentially about the separate stake, the separate blocks because most people may be thinking of it as one block, but it's two. There's the Pecan Field, which Eka had been working on for quite a while until the depressed oil market environment hit, where we saw oil prices really drop significantly. And then, of course, COVID worsened that. We are seeking to procure 37% of that. And then the Nyankom ex exploratory field, that's we're seeking to procure 70%. I'm just wondering, if there's been some significant work done on Pekan, mm. isn't it worth our while um, to borrow for that development program? But Nyankom is exploratory. We are now going to see if we'll find something. We are, we are not exactly sure if the, the reserves are, are verified, are quantified. Would you prefer that or would civil society prefer that we invested in a field that already has verified, uh, quantifiable resources? No, I think you're spot on. And that is one of the questions we are raising, that you have two different uh, blocks with different stages right, of development or exploration. Uh, the Nyankum discovery on the AGM block is just one discovery. Mm -hmm. So the campaign that AGM had, they drilled two wells. One was a dry well, and one was a discovery. And now, the AGM is saying that that one well discovery, that hasn't been appraised, with initial estimates that they claim to be around 127 million. They want to sell that well to Ghana and values it at $700 million. How do you come by that? When you haven't done the necessary work to be able to estimate whether Indeed, that uh, uh, discovery can move into production. Because in, in assessing these resources, you are not only interested in how much you can estimate, but based on the geology and the rocks, how much can actually be extracted from the grounds. And that demands much more work for you to be able to come to that assessment. So how does GMPC sit down for somebody to value one discovery at $700 million dollars? you know, to influence the conversation on how much you want to pay for, for that well. Where you can clearly see that Ake has defaulted on his plan of work. Ake has defaulted on his plan of work, yes, but we all know the, the circumstances that led to that. We all know those circumstances. Which is COVID, right? It's not just COVID. It was the depressed oil market environment, which had been going bad since 2018. No, but you have a contract with Ghana, right? The contract has prescriptions. So you want, them, you want them to borrow to do the development. Is that what, is that what offends you? That, that to the extent that they made a promise, they are not willing to borrow on their balance sheet to get the development done? No, so we are talking about uh, uh, AGM block now. Okay, so right? you, you are talking about the AGM when block. When you make a discovery, yeah. right, you are required within 180 days to do an appraisal. Right, so even if you have an excuse, that's anyway, it is about six months. Even if you have an excuse, maybe another six months, it's been two years, the well hasn't been appraised, there's no agency to appraise it. Okay. So, why are we pampering them? 
<laughs> and then now going to think about valuing at 700 million when they have refused to do the needful. You know, the contract is to be enforced. Okay. If the company cannot do the work that they promised to deliver, and if we have time to come back to the history of the okay. block, we get to understand the kind of incentive that we gave to Ake for them to be able to explore and do the necessary work on the block. If they are no longer interested in doing the necessary work, why are we being Father Christmas in this case? Okay, and uh, that's Ben Boachi there. He's the executive director of ASEP. So let's now turn our attention to Dr. Suleimana. Uh, Dr. Suleimana, I understand you support the deal, isn't it? If you can unmute Dr. Suleimana because I can't hear you, I beg your pardon. Hello, Dr. Suleimana. Okay, it looks like we are having some audio challenges with Dr. Suleimana. We'll try and correct that and come back to him. Yes, Dr. Suleimana? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, unfortunately, I can't hear Dr. Suleimana. We'll come back to him and um, we'll bring uh, his perspectives to you. It's still key points here on TV3 and 3FM. Thank you very much for joining us. And let's welcome to our studio as well, Dr. Thieu Achampong, economist and political risk strategist. Thank you very much for making some time for us and you're welcome. Good morning. Great. So we've been talking about the um, GMPC Acre deal and we've been trying to dissect and distinguish between the two fields uh, under uh, you know, discussion. But first, is the figure being put forward um, to procure these stakes exaggerated. Yes, uh, good morning once again to you and, and to your listeners. Um, I think I have had cause to run some of the numbers uh, myself. I've spoken to at least about 20 or so professionals in the industry as well, both in Ghana and outside. And the broad conclusion is that the asset is overvalued or overpriced, and therefore the figure that is being bandied about um, does not really um, fit or align to what um, one should actually pay for if they were to go to the market for the, uh, for the asset. But I guess there are other substantive policy issues that we can discuss, but specifically on the question that you ask. Certainly, the, um, what is being purported as the transaction value or price or what they would negotiate on that basis, um, I don't think that the two assets are worth that price. What kind of figure would be a reasonable figure? So I have had or run some, we ran some numbers and I've been quoted on this. I think we're looking probably at half a billion um, mm -hmm. as the net asset value, um, possibly um, based on various assumptions go into this. But one of the key assumptions is actually the oil price. Um, and in some of the numbers that we're privy to, um, Ben would also be privy to, um, they're using about $67, $65 a barrel. And we've had cause to actually challenge those numbers uh, because if you look at some of the projections on the long-term trajectory of oil prices, certainly we would, should, should be valuing the asset between 55 and 60 dollars a barrel and one dollar a barrel makes a big difference in terms of these valuations so when you run that and you run other scenarios on the resource estimates so how much oil can you actually produce from the two discoveries because they're two separate things and you know you make a, you know a few further assumptions then you actually come to a substantially lower figure than um, what is being purported. I think one of the things people would like to know is that, is it more about the fact that ACA, AGM, had put forward a plan of development and they've not implemented the plan of development and yet are expecting to make this kind of money from the government of Ghana? Is that what is offensive as opposed to actually getting them to make this investment? Um, I think it, it goes both ways because there are multiple stakeholders and people have different perspectives on it. I've spoken to people and some of the broad consensus is that um, Ake and its related sister company 
want to have their cake and eat it mm -hmm. or eat their cake and have it however that goes um but to the extent that ghana went all out literally to get them to make these um investments in the field only two years ago yes um and then subsequently pretty much uh, have turned themselves around and saying okay we want to sell the asset to you selling the asset is not the issue per se it happens people do m a deals in the industry across the board the substantive issue really is okay at what price do you want to buy for example uh, the asset the other substantive issue is just in may of this year Ake um, released various statements because the perception in the market was that they were going to sell out of ghana mm -hmm. and there was a statement that came from the ghana office to the effect that they are committed long term to ghana and they are looking forward to resubmitting their revised plan of development by December of this year. This was just a few months ago. Only then, a few weeks or months down the line, for us to hear that they are seeking to divest some of their equity shares in the assets. So you begin to see some inconsistencies in the rhetoric and in the narrative. Um, and secondly, question then also then comes, well, if a company wants to divest, um, then should we be willing to invest in that? So, I, I mean, should the national company be willing to invest in that? Or you wait for them to submit the revised plan of development. Let's see the new numbers. Let's see the new revenue, um, the new production proje projections. Let's see the development concept that they intend to use before you can actually make. There are so many uncertainties and unknowns around this particular proposed transaction at this time, which then all fits into inflating the asset value. Mm. That really is, you know, it's really the substantive the issues issue. that we, we need to be uh, discussing, in my view. All and, right. and, and, and even if I may add, you see, as we speak, Ake has a vessel on site doing geotechnical and geophysical studies that informs whatever technology they anticipate to use for production. And they are telling us they have a, a, a break-even price of $30, even before those studies are concluded. How do they come by those numbers? And GMBC has bought into it, all right? And if Ake has, is saying that they've brought down the break-even price from $48 from the project finance perspective to $30, that makes the project even much more profitable. Why are they running away from the project? <laughs> All right. Let's try Dr. Suleimana now and see if uh, the audio has been fixed. Dr. Suleimana, can you hear me? Yeah, I think I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. We still have technical challenges because I can really barely hear you. If you can just yeah, increase the volume on your, on your Zoom. Yeah, I think this maximum. Can you hear me, Diva? Okay, I think we'll have to try and fix that uh, from the production bench. Um, sorry about that, uh, Dr. Suleimana. Let me come back to um, you, um, Dr. Theo Champong. From a risk perspective, isn't it really just the case that Ghana is a difficult fiscal and production environment? Because Ghana, before the discovery of Jubilee, used to be called the graveyard of uh, petroleum companies. Jubilee de-risked the field uh, and the area. But the reality is that since Jubilee and even ENI, Sankofa Jinyami, we've not seen any real, you know, push. Hess was there for quite a while, but left. Yeah. And, and Exxon has also left. It just seems to me that there might be better prospects elsewhere. And we're talking about offshore Guyana and Suriname, where lots of discoveries have been made by Exxon and, of course, uh, by Hess together with Sinoc. So it really begs the question about the investment being made. It just means that our environment is more difficult, and so the risk is higher, and so the costs are more. Yeah, I don't think our environment necessarily is more difficult. Um, so I work in this industry. I talk to investors all the time. Um, and of course, countries are competing for the same petrodollar investments, right? Um, and it depends on the materiality of the resource base that you've got, which also is a function of like your tax regime or fiscal regime, etc. But if you actually look at the 
prevailing tax regime in Ghana is actually in the middle of the park. So it's not necessarily like the most onerous or most difficult environment to actually do um, business in when it comes to um, oil and gas. I but think but didn't the amendment of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act in 2015 make it more difficult no, for companies? It didn't. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So, okay, we increased the carried and participating interest mm -hmm. from here to it's about 10 to 15 in percent. Yes. Um, and then there were a few other minor adjustments um, here and there. But there, there, what, there were more fees being charged by the Petroleum Commission. Yes, the local content requirements the cumulative, became stronger. The cumulative package is what one or one metric you use to assess this is the government take, right? Which is like a benchmark across the board. And if you look at the government take in Ghana for a number of the oil fields, it's actually one of the lowest in the world. It's between 55 and 60 percent. Um, if you add the carried interest rate, it's about 67 to 70 percent. The IMF has an estimate that says that what constitutes a decent or reasonable government take is between 60 and 85 percent. So we are just right in that ballpark figure. So I, I don't think that what we have in terms of the investment environment is necessarily disincentivizing to investors. What has happened is that there are other opportunities for investors, of course, elsewhere, like in Guyana, where has left here, went there, and they've got 10 times more the resource discovery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than you've got here in Ghana. And then now there's, you know, the bigger conversation about, like, energy transition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Fine. The question then becomes, what should be the policy response of government or, say, the national oil company to this? Does that then in entail or mean that because people are living and, you know, people talk about, quote, and unquote, stranded asset, we should necessarily be buying any asset that, that is on the market? What other strategic options are there? So in this particular case, we know, for example, that GMPC could possibly, if it's all about reserves and production that they want, there are a couple of other assets right here within the Ghana offshore jurisdiction that they could possibly buy, and which even are p currently producing and has you know, relatively lower um, cost of production as well. So the, the argument really is not so much about the extenuating or external factors per se, as for me it is to do with Let's interrogate the specific transaction that is on the table and its merit, and we can situate that within the bigger policy discourse. All right. And you're watching the key points here on TV3 and 3FM. It's also live on DSTV 279, and you can follow us online at 3news.com. We take a quick break, and we'll be right back. You're welcome back to The Key Points. Feel free to send your questions to us on 055 uh, 055-369-8789. Uh, let's now go back to our Zoom where we fixed uh, our audio challenges and welcome Dr. Suleimana. Thank you very much, sir, for your patience. Good morning. Uh, good morning to you and uh, good morning to your cherished viewers. Thank you. And, uh, you and uh, ben. ben. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I understand that you support the deal, but before you tell us why, what do you make of the numbers put out suggesting that the valuation of these blocks uh, are overpriced? Yeah, Yifa, thank you very much. Um, I'll put on record that absolutely I have no uh, uh, problem with these valuations and stuff uh, going on. And I think that's an excellent thing to do uh, because if you quite remember, um, this deal had bipartisan support that quickly slipped through parliament. And so it is uh, agencies like CSOs to further delve deep into what is in the figures, what are the numbers. And I think Ben and uh, Tio, they, they delve so much into that. You know, and I think so, so for the numbers, I think they can continue to question that. In fact, at the end of the day, it will only give us value for money. And I, I, I absolutely, I don't have any problem with that. Yeah. 
but the fact that Parliament approved it as a bipartisan uh, decision doesn't make it, you know, right or doesn't mean that we've gotten value for money. Shouldn't we have done that interrogation before uh, the approval? Yeah, that's correct. And that's why I think, uh, I mean, in future, I mean, involving, you know, we have to have broad-based involvement. I think what, what, I know, what, what, I, what I tend to notice is the fact that there's been some gaps. You know, you can hear Ben Baji saying, I mean, they try to reach GMPC, they are not getting that. And then at the end, at the, at the other, at, on the other hand, you know, Kiki Sapon is saying his doors are open. You know, so I, I, am, I, am, I, I want to look at it in, uh, in a different perspective. I, I'll be frank with you, Jifa. I'm an upstream player, you know, and I understand the business and I understand what goes on. So I just tell you why I think we need to sanitize the deal, but we shouldn't throw it, I mean, as it is. We, should, we shouldn't throw it away. Now, number one, um, um, we have a, tech, a, a technonic, a, 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 what we call a technonic movement, and that is real. Movement in the sense that we have <clears throat> upsurge in the world of renewables. Um, if, I, if you look at, if you just take yourself back some few months ago, I mean, we have three things that happened in the industry, and it was not serendipitous. It was all calculated and well planned. We had environmentalists winning the landmark case against Shell in Netherlands. We have Exxon Mobil, you know, they were able to displace about two, two of their board of directors by climate change activists. And the third one was, you know, the release of IEA report, a diamond report that sort of suggests that, I mean, if we have to achieve net zero by 2050, we have to stop investment into the world of hydrocarbon. That is a killer, I, I'll tell you as a player. If you stop investment into the world of hydrocarbon, that ends it. Now, <clears throat> where I will extend the discussion to the fact that now, if our case or our, our, our situation is a peculiar one, we have certain things we call ESG. Jifa, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Anyway, we have ESG, what we call environmental social governance. Now, this environmental social governance is gathering a lot of momentum. You know, to the extent that, I mean, capital, get, get, going out to get capital from the capital market is becoming constrained and it's becoming so competitive. And so what it means is that what it, mean, what it will mean is that players now have to look inwards, like it or not. Where I work, I think we started with 20%. I can tell you that my cooperation is now having 60%. You have to start somewhere. So I don't support the idea that, okay, GMPs have been given a whole year, you know, I mean, I'm about a decade ago, they've been giving money about $1 billion. They have not been able to drill a well. So should we not, I mean, should we leave it like that? That is for God's sake, that's our upstream. And we don't, we don't have anything than that. And I can tell you that, and I'm not saying that, I mean, the value, they shouldn't question the value. That is undoubtable, and I support that. And they should keep questioning the value until we get value for money. But let's not lump up things as if nothing is happening in the global phase. A lot is happening, and it is moving very fast. And so where I was coming to learn is the fact that, I mean, getting money in the capital market is becoming constrained. It's becoming expensive because of what uh, this ESG's requirement. So you just look at this. Let's play the devil advocate. Assuming ENI and Talo, as we speak now, they exit Ghana, we don't have upstream again. That's a fact. If ENI and Talo exit Ghana as we stop now, our upstream is collapsed. No, but if Talo so and ENI decide to exit Ghana, it may only be because they've got another buyer. It may be a buyer that has expertise in um, ultra deep or deep water production, and that may not be an entire loss. That, that's where you are lucky. ExxonMobil have left. Have we gotten anybody? We are still struggling. So um, I, I, the, I, the idea, I know people don't, don't, don't buy into the idea of stranded asset. I, I completely subscribe to that. And then we are getting there. Okay, okay. So, so, so you... you, what I'm trying, you just so one. that's why I believe... If I, uh, sorry? Come just again, a quick one. Ahead. So I wanted to ask, so you support the energy transition argument? Oh, yes. <laughs> and it's real. See, my company is typically upstream, and it's, uh, 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 I mean, uh, we call it petroleum development of Oman. Now, we just metamorphosis into energy development of Oman. If you look at the amount of transition, the amount of, you know, I mean, uh, uh, renewable energy push that is going on, even in that space, that is high. Okay, so, I mean, we don't have to sit down at a point in time that investors leave, and then we can't take care of our destiny. That's just what I'm saying. We need to have our upstream ritual. So questioning the figures is perfect. In fact, 
I, I'm happy about the whole thing because if you look at because of the uh, by Simon and the, I mean Ben Bochi and their critic, I mean their detailed and in-depth critic of the analysis. I think that you 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 just heard. I mean, we just heard that uh, we're going to have a Bank of America to do another evaluation. That's the beauty of the whole thing. So I don't want us to lump it as if everything is bad. No, no, no. That it cannot be bad. It cannot be bad investing in your upstream. That cannot be bad. Okay. So All right. Just, so, but value for money is also paramount. I don't, I don't, I don't have any problem with that. Okay. But let's not go into the bit. Okay. Go ahead. Just a quick one, and then I'll come back to the studio if you can answer this briefly. So I, I asked Ben Boache whether we should focus on one field, the pecan field, which is a development field. Good work has been done there. Instead of focusing as well on the Yankom field, which is exploratory and the, the resources are unverified, uh, unquantified. If we were to look at the deal again for, for a focus just on pecan, isn't that more realistic? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, if it's all about the risk profile, uh, like uh, Tio mentioned. See, before you enter into any of this field, you have to do a kind of what you call risk assessment in terms of your cost-benefit analysis. And so if you look at that, of course, we are told that AGM, uh, we haven't done appraisal yet. So we can say that, I mean, the risk profile in quantum-wise is, 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 is high. But Pecan Field, I, I believe it's been uh, in a way of, I mean, it's been the, the, the risk to some extent. But where I was also looking at is the, you know, the Votain Basin. I thought also that's another opportunity we could have looked at, which is onshore. So depending on where we want to go, I think we should just do analysis of the risk profile, see where the risk is minimal, because we don't have zero risk. We have to look at where we can minimize the risk to what we call as low as reasonable practicable, whereby your investment or the cost-benefit analysis favor, favor you. Okay? So, yes, pick and fill, of course. I mean, if you want to compare Pekan and AGM, I will go. I will hundred percent say that Pekan, in terms of risk profile, is significantly lower than AGM. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Suleiman. And let me come back to the studio. Uh, interesting thoughts from him. D do you agree with the energy transition argument? And for the uninitiated, energy transition is just really the movement from using what we know as the normal fuels, you know, petrol, Con diesel, fossils, and all that yes. commercial fossil fuel, and moving into renewable energy like solar, wind power, uh, biofuels, and the like. Yeah, I mean, what COVID, for example, has actually done is, to an extent, catalyze the rate of the transition, right? What we don't know fully as yet is how the transition will pan out. Right. How, so how it will the come argument, out in the Africa, argument, in no, Africa or globally, globally, including in Africa. So the argument really is that some say we have a 20-year window to maximize our oil resources because by that time you will have had renewables fully kicking in. Others also say, well, you probably are looking at a 30, 40-year window, or we're even talking post 2050 before that happens. The point here really is that depending on the state of the world, you are being forced to think strategically about how these scenarios ultimately will play out. But in relation to um, uh, Yusuf's point, yeah. is that we have seen certain oil companies and majors make certain actions on the basis of what they perceive or feel to be the threat of the energy transition. And so we're seeing divestment of assets, et cetera, all over the place, and investment flows also possibly being curtailed as a result of, of that. That would have some impact on your upstream industry. It may have some impact even on oil market as well. That's all given. We know that. The question then becomes, as a country, what should you do in relation to this transition? Is it a threat or is it an opportunity? Because both ways would inform certain actions. So if you perceive it as a threat, and um, as sometimes we're try attempting to do here, then okay, then let's quickly maximize our hydrocarbon resources and produce and you know um, and get out of there before you kind of lose those potential revenues. If you see the transition also as an opportunity then, okay, can you create or build new industrial clusters, for example, leveraging the new technologies that the transition presents? That's also another thing. 
But specifically in the context of the Trek side of things, when it comes to upstream, does then that mean that because there's a transition and people are living, we should sell things or you know or, or um, um, buy it rather at any price that is being given to us? That is where a number of us really have the challenge. I we don't or personally, I don't dispute the fact that there is some transitioning happening, and that has affected the investment environment, which even t to the extent why maybe companies like Aka and the rest are even struggling maybe to raise financing. And I use that advisedly, maybe, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that as a result of that, we should just go and buy the asset at whatever price that is being quoted. Mm. That, that really, that is, I think, the distinction should... that needs to be made. All right. Uh, ben, y yeah. your thoughts on whether really we will be significantly affected by the energy transition model. I, I find that maybe for Africa, we are still an emerging you know, continent. We are, we are growing. There's still a lot of movement. Um, lots of people are still buying cars. Uh, there's a lot of travel that's still to be done continent-wide. I'm just wondering really if that's, it's realistic to think that the energy transition will affect us significantly. Um, which is why we, we must have a foothold or GMPC should take a foothold in this uh, deal. Yes, I think if uh, we have had a problem with GMPC using the transition as the, the, the basis for this particular transaction, and we've been careful to isolate the transition, the, the transaction from the entire transition conversation. And that is why if you check what civil society has been doing, we've been looking at this particular transaction and what it means for Ghana what the numbers are, what the history of the block is. You know, the question about how Africa will be impacted by the transition, I mean, it's, research is still ongoing to really look at what the impact could be and where Africa will be uh, uh, in that space. And I see here the assumption that the world will not need the oil and Africa will still need it. And if you speak to many people, that is the kind of conversation they want to uh, paint, that we have to continuously use uh, fossil fuel even if the world uh, doesn't need it. And that, for me, is, is an error <laughs> that we are making. We are assuming that if everybody in the world is moving to electric cars, the African will continue to use uh, 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 diesel-based or petrol-based cars. That is a wrong assumption. You have to speak to the African first to find out whether he is going to move into an electric car. And we have many aged cars around. So even for us to transit to uh, an electric car if it becomes cheaper, could be faster than even the West, where they have brand new cars and they are still producing some, they haven't stopped. So they have a much longer lead time uh, to even transition in terms of uh, automobile uh, than we have. And recently we saw the Ministry of Energy um, uh, commissioning an assembly plant of electric cars. Are we joking about that one? We need to speak to the people to gauge their appetite. Are they going to stay with fossil fuel cars or are they going to uh, 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 move to electric cars when it comes. So those are areas where research is still ongoing. Mm. So the specific question about this transaction is what we need to interrogate much more and, you know, examine the excuses that we are given on um, stranded asset. I mean, if you're talking about stranded asset, it is not Pekan that is stranded. Pekan is a, a project that is supposed to move into production. So the company decides to move into production or relinquish and go by our laws. It's not a stranded asset. The, your stranded assets are the ones that you have not discovered. Are you going to move aggressively to be able to make new discoveries by investing into exploration? And you're saying that the exploration, uh, exploration budget is you know, squeezed because the market is not responding uh, to investment in uh, 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 fossil fuels. So is GMP is going to take up that role and begin to explore? As we speak, they are operators of three blocks. They haven't drilled a well. And you learn by doing. You are in Talo. Talo hires contractors to drill. They don't drill themselves. So the drilling companies have the engineers that will support you to do the drilling and the necessary learning. And you progress to be an operator. Isn't the MODEC that is operating uh, Talos, managing Talos assets? Is GMPC going to be the, the, the all in all operator with all the capacity that he claims he wants to learn to operate a block? What is it in, in an operator? Uh, should grow.
Okay. So those are the small screens we want to diffuse. To say that if you are talking about stranded assets, those are the assets you have not discovered. Those are the terrains that you are saying Exxon is exiting. What are you going to do with that block? Are you going to go in there and explore for it? The market is not responding to oil investment. Why are you going to borrow the 1.65 billion if we wanted to uh, do that? Mm. There's a question. You know, without the budget coming in. Mm. There's a question here, and it's from Kwame. It says, my elementary understanding of the existing agreements between Ghana and ACA and AGM on one hand is that if these two companies fail to live up to the agreements with Ghana and they could not develop or find a buyer, the fields would revert to the Republic of Ghana as owners of these fields without the country having to pay anything at all. Can your experts throw some light on this for me? A few. Uh, yeah, yeah, precisely. I mean, so um, what governs the relationship between ACA or any IOC and the state is the Petroleum Agreement. And within the Petroleum Agreement, there are specific provisions that um, says that, for example, during the exploration phase, if you don't develop or don't even find anything, um, then you relinquish parts of the block back to the state, which can then, they can then offload to the market. If you also decide that you're going to even leave entirely, even having made the discovery at some point, and you want to write down the, the value of the asset, that goes automatically back to the state, because by uh, our laws and by the Constitution, the assets or the resources are vested, I think, in the president for and on behalf of the state. If you read uh, Article 269, I believe, of the 1992 Constitution. Constitution. So yes, the question that is coming through um, is so absolutely why right. Why don't we, then why don't we rather so do it, that? It go, no, it goes back to what some of us have said, which is that why rush this? Because clearly, all the indications and things that um, at least I've seen so far indicates to me that th there seems to be some attempt to push through or force through the deal. And I'm like, okay, let's take a, a, a step back and actually interrogate not only the numbers, but you know, the bigger strategic imperative. So let's, okay, buy or say the argument about the transition is, is true or is happening. Um, what do you want to do at a wider government level in terms of your response, right, uh, to that? It surely cannot just be a piecemeal um, approach. So that's why, in my view, I've called and said that we need to really take a bit of a step back and begin to actually interrogate it. But the way it's being done and made to look like now, it just comes across to me like it's just been first I mean, remember this is the same country where only seven eight years ago we sent eight petroleum agreements to parliament under a certificate of emergency seemingly with bipartisan quote buy-in as well and down the line most of those blocks people are not producing from it so we we have made policy mistakes in the past and it looks as though we are repeating some of those same policy mistakes without taking a step back to reflect on why we are where we are. Mm. Uh, let me come to Dr. Suleimana. So why don't we rather take our time? I mean, there's no rush, don't you think? Yeah, I, <clears throat> thank you very much. Yeah, there is no, and I think that's uh, um, uh, what is currently ongoing. You know, the fact that, I mean, uh, they've elected, you know, uh, Bank of America, you know, to do further valuation. For me, if you get value for money, that is beautiful. And that's actually what is ongoing. This kind of talks up and down is actually leading to you know, a bit of focus. So what, what we need as, as people, as Ghanaians. So at the end of the day, um, this kind of talks, when you aggregate them, you know, um, it, will, it will bring, it will, it, will, it, will, it will illuminate what actually we are, we are aiming to get. So yes, value for money is, is, is excellent. But <laughs> if I just remember, Time is not waiting for anybody. I'm not saying we should rush this deal, but just remember the perspective that I'm talking about. I told you that in this industry, what Ben mentioned first that, I mean, and, and I think you also alluded to the fact that capital is not really available. Before capital wasn't available. And COVID had just catalyzed the whole system of, you know, how fast we want to go through this, uh, this journey, okay? And so it will come to a time that it is coming very soon that seeking 
money from the outside, I mean, from outside where I mean, going to the capital market, there, there are going to be a lot of strings attached to that. And, and that will make borrowing very expensive. And so that's the aspect we are looking at. You can say, okay, Ghana, we, are, we have a particular situation. No, we are in the global community. Ghana, we are, we are still, you know, high, heavily dependent on borrowing from outside. Now, what about, the, what, what about when time comes that, I mean, there are a lot of bottlenecks in this borrowing that we cannot borrow, okay, and that we cannot invest in, into our asset. So I'm saying that we should not rush, but uh, there is no time waiting. I mean, we don't have time, uh, the maximum time waiting for us, you know, to, to, you know, to, to, to say, okay, I mean, uh, there's no need to rush this deal, or there's no need to rush, there's no need to rush this deal, or there's a need to rush this deal. What I am calling for is the fact that, I mean, GMPC and then the CSOs, I mean, they have to work together. That's paramount. Because if you look at everybody's calling in the same shots. So what is the problem? I think the problem is mostly about the numbers. But if you talk about the numbers and you and you tend to negate this transition aspect of it, I think we are making a very big mistake. Okay, so from where I am coming from, so it is actually the NOCs, it, it is actually the, so just, let, 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 let me just land there just quickly. It is actually the NOCs who are championing energy transition. And I would stay categorical that I believe hydrocarbon resources will be with us for the next two decades, three decades, or maybe uh, four decades to come, all right? So if you flip the coin anyhow, whether transition is coming or transition is not coming, we just need to make sure that we retool our, our upstream. Let's not wait, let's try to retool it, make it vibrant, so that in any eventuality that we are caught, you know, uh, flat-footed, maybe any, anybody exiting, you know, without we prepared, and that, that, that is going to be a very big problem. So that's the argument. So I don't have any problem, <laughs> absolutely. If you understand me, I don't have any problem with what is going on. And I think it's perfect. It can only make our, our system very strong. It can only make our system very resilient and robust. And so that should go on. Why not invest in a field that is producing? We know that one of Talo or one of the Jubilee partners, Anadako, uh, has a, a new deal with um, Occidental uh, and another company in the U.S. Why not then buy an Adako stake? Why not buy stakes where they are producing? Money comes to you. And then you can use that to invest in maybe a virgin field that you're, you're not sure of. Isn't that more value that's, for money instead? That's, that's, again, it comes to a strategic decision. And GMPC has to be fully responsible for that. And so if whatever happened and the deal goes you know, where Ghanaians don't want to, I mean, GMPC will take full responsibility for that. So deciding whether, I mean, we want to invest into our existing field or we want to go into an area that haven't been invested, it is just a matter of strategic decision. And so I don't really, I don't really uh, have problem with that. Yeah. All right. And let's read some messages that have come to us. And this one from Aziz Inwa, and he says, I'm scandalized regarding the GMPC acre deal is obviously clear that some state actors seek to make money out of this. The inconsistency and rhetoric from the state actors is worrying to some of us because the amount of money going into this deal could have built some 300 brand new SHSs and it could again have constructed the dual carriage road from Nkoko to Kumasi to Hamile. In fact, the government should protect the public purse and stop the big grammar, fix the country now. Another message says, on the GNPC acre deal, I think the price sale on this is too high on the remaining, looking at what remains on the ground. It will be better for the oil to remain underground rather than for them uh, to take from Ghanaians. That's from Abladi, from Ifiakuma Zongo in Takradi. Uh, Abdul Razak from Boku says there must be transparency in this acre GNPC deal. We must get value for money. GMPC and government needs to come again. And Charles Nyame from Asaman Kesi writes, ever since the MPP government took over in 2017, it's been a chain of scandals, and this is the latest with the GMPC acre deal. And this is being attacked with such pure arrogance. And the sad part is the majority of Ghanaians who are suffering the consequences um, of this small group of uh, people who are benefiting god save ghana thank you very much for your messages you can send us some more on 055-369-8789 let me come back to uh, our studio guests so um mr Boachi, i think one of the criticisms for gmpc is that we've not seen them engage fully 
in an operatorship. And the view is that we need to see them demonstrate that this is an organization that has been criticized for receiving lots of money from their various uh, stakes and current interests, and yet the money is deployed in manners that have been criticized. What should GMPC do to earn the trust of the public such that if really they want to become an operator, which was ideally part of their vision and should have oh, been implemented been been, yeah. by 2020 mm -hmm. and the time has passed, what should they do such that we can have confidence that they will do it? I know you've mentioned that MODEC is an FPSO manager, not just even in Ghana, but in, in, in Brazil and, and Mexico. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, and even just before that, I want to touch on the investment conversation sure. a little bit. You know, we are making an argument that the market is not interested in oil operations. We are shifting focus, the market is shifting focus to renewables. And this is a new conversation where when the market is not interested, we are calling on the state to now go to the same market and say, instead of the oil industry securitizing the investment, the states want to securitize it. And that is a new conversation in this whole energy transition uh, conversation that we're having. Which country is doing that now? So if Ghana wants to go into that arena where we're using the budget to support GMPC's acquisition, we need to really interrogate that to ensure that the risks are really covered. Uh, otherwise, we're just doing the same thing. The market says they're not interested. You go and borrow more or less for development and you push into oil and gas. So it is, it's a question about whether you invest your borrowings into building schools, building hospitals, building roads, or go and use it looking for oil. And that is the, 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 the conversation that we've been uh, uh, you know, asked to engage in. And it's a very, very new terrain. That's what we're saying, that we need more time to dissect all the aspects of this transaction. It's not just the values. And it comes back to uh, your question about how does GMPC become an operator. And we have shown in our conversation that GMPC has just not been willing to be an operator. I, I, is it, over is it the fair year. to say they are, they are not willing? It's an expensive business. I mean, a lot of the companies <laughs> use their reserve-based lending See, to borrow, GMPC, and then they go back and renegotiate GMPC, with the banks. GMPC has spent on anything and everything apart from oil drilling. <laughs> and you know that. They are building schools, they are building hospitals. Which is not a bad roads. thing. That is not their job. Are they quasi government? They have corporate. Fund? They have corporate social responsibility. So that also do. Be so more also than do the function. That cannot be more than. I mean, does Talo spend more on corporate social responsibility than drain wells? No. Does Ezon do that? There is no serious oil business that does that. And they have shown consistently that they are not interested in becoming an operator, because if you had to trade off, you know using $40 million to go and drill, or piling up your organizational structure, or ballooning your uh, staff from 300 to over 600, those are choices for a corporation to do. And they have chose to do the inefficient uh, uh, thing rather than becoming an operator. And we have shown that for all that we have given them for the past 10 years, about a billion dollars, they have not decided to use even $15 million to do the needful or to drill for a well. So the right thing to do, if, coming back to your question, is to go back to the blocks that they have taken as operators. If you are saying that you are an operator and you're holding on to the blocks and you cannot drill, then give it up. How, how about the suggestion that they could buy uh, into fields that are producing, for instance, and, and grow from there? Because it only takes money to get money. So if you, if you invest in a field and you are getting money, then at least you can invest it in another field instead of just investing and you're not sure if you are getting anything in return. No, I mean, that is also another conversation that we can have. And you cited uh, uh, the exit of Anadako, which is available. I think they are looking for about $600 million for a producing field. All right. But GMPC is not interested in that. They want to take one that they are not sure. It has to go in. And you know, Talo is here, uh, ENI is here, and all the three fields, the projected production, we never met them. All right? So there are risks until you get into production before you really see what is possible uh, to be extracted from the ground. But they rather want to go into that risk whilst, you know, they, they're making arguments that um, 
uh, uh, they don't need to go and drill uh, uh, and operate their field from the beginning. And what we are saying is that you don't need the tutelage or the apprenticeship that they are seeking from ECA to be able to become an operator. When Talo came, they were not operating giant fields. They used the same contractors, the same mess, the same slumbages, the same modex who are doing the work. And the engineers are also learning. And they are procuring the engineers who can support uh, them to be able to operate the field. The amount of money that GMPC gets from Talos and all the companies for technology support can even procure or recruit the kind of engineers that GMPC wants with the relevant capacity to manage fields and operate them. So when they are talking about experience, I don't think they want to be uh, uh, producing FPSOs or they want to be producing the subsea structures. What you're looking for is capable men who can design wells, who can be able to uh, uh, detect you know, problems when they look at data. Those are the capable people you are looking for to be able to assemble the needed technology in the well to be able to manage a field. So what is this fuzz about? We want to be an operator, we want to learn, we want to spend so much time and bring in Ake as the as the, as the, as, you know, the extraordinary company that can train you to become the operator. They are just refusing to do their needs for. Should we and that is the point we are, we are making to them. Dr. It wouldn't cost them $10 million to recruit the right men and people. I mean, Dr. Yusuf is there. He works on the fields. It doesn't cost that much to do that. They are just refusing to do the need for. And just using that as an excuse to get the budget to support this kind of transactions. Mm. Dr. Champong, should our resource remain below the ground? Um, you need to exploit and extract it. I think the, the conversation, picking up from where the Dr. Dr. Yusuf and then, um, uh, Ben have left off, is really about the role or the strategic role of GMPC in the Ghanaian economy and specifically within Ghana's upstream sector. Right? Because um, you look at the investment spend that GMPC has made over the last maybe 12 or so years since at least first oil and you try and analyze that vis-a-vis -vis their core mandate as defined in the uh, the, uh, the law PNDC law 83 um, there are some questions you know um, rightfully so I believe that they need to actually answer in relation to their core mandate of looking exploiting and searching for oil. I think some people are making the argument now is that, okay, we made mistakes in the past. So give us another opportunity mm -hmm. to um, correct ourselves. that kind of uh, mistake. Um, but you know, the, the famous uh, um, saying, say, Abobi Bekawa, you know, and I say, Kwatri Kwatri Obema Bibia, Bisa Nidin, something along those lines. So that's where I think some of the issues that people have comes from. But also the going forward, I think the bigger conversation really in relation to this whole mandate thing then becomes okay. If you want your national oil company to play a bigger role, maybe because of energy transition, maybe because other IOCs are living, etc., etc., where should they start focusing from? That's number one. Number two, you would have to amend, for example, in Ghana's case, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act to allow the national oil company, GMPC, to actually go and borrow on the market because currently they are constrained from doing any reserve-based uh, lending um, as well. But even when we do all of those things, it comes back, okay, how then do we ensure, given the history, some of the things Ben is talking about, how do we ensure that they do not repeat some of these mistakes where in some years the amount that is spent on say corporate social investment is the same as what you're spending in operational expenditure for one of your fields right it, it you see some inherent inconsistencies in in there you can argue that okay gmpc is not just a national company it has a national mandate so maybe they need to buy the social license to operate that argument is there. But at the core is that you need to grow the asset base. You need to increase and maximize the revenues before you can even make those CSR, CSI type investments. So I, I think 
we are having a, an important conversation here, which is really about what is the role of GMPC within this whole architecture of the upstream environment, given that some energy transition or whatever may happen um, at whatever point or period in time. And if we then need to retool the National Oil Company and even amend, say, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act to accommodate or allow them to buy, to borrow, to finance certain um, acquisitions, then we have to interrogate the quality of those acquisitions that are being made vis-a-vis -vis other investment options that are available to them. And that's where, you know, I, I, I think we need to have that, that conversation. Uh, Dr. Suleimana, you say that at least there should be an opportunity uh, to start. But the question I also wish to pose relates to our legislators. So there's a question about whether really they even delve deep into these issues. I know there have been some, there are some members of parliament who've, you know, um, been in the energy industry for a bit, but there's a sense that at the parliamentary level, these kinds of conversations should be what um, we have at the committee level or even have debated in parliament. We are not getting enough of that. And that is why by the time this kind of suggestion about well, this is what we want to do comes out. There's a whole hula baloo. Yeah, uh, you are spot on. And, uh, and, I, and I can tell you that even though we are saying it is bipartisan, there are a lot of members from each side, whether NDC or NPP, who are terrible against, you know, the deal outright. Really? You know, That's so, not the sense I've gotten. Of course. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, of course. I can, I, I, I'm, I'm just telling you that that, that, that that's the whole thing. So, and that, 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 that is where the importance of you know agencies like CEOs become very critical. See, I like the fact that the CEOs, I mean, they have been able to eliminate the whole idea and conversation is ongoing. And I can tell you that as long as these conversations are ongoing, I mean, we are getting to a point where we're going to get a very good deal. All right. So uh, Ben mentioned a point, you know, uh, and I think you also mentioned that point. GMPC, as a matter of fact, <laughs> they have to be focused. That's that's emphatic and that's very clear. And so, if you are focused as an NOC or a national oil, you know, a, a company, then your mandate has to be clear. And the mandate is there; it's written. See, we have a lot of we are. If you go to the PRM, I mean, everything is well demarcated and well written. But unfortunately, for what whatever reason, I don't know why we are able to follow this. And there are no punitive measures. Uh, you know, when they are di when they diverge, you know, from where they are commanded, nothing happens. For instance, I am terribly against holding on to blocks. You know, for my place, you cannot hold block more than 70 years. They will give you first three years, another three years, then two years, that's all. And even the first two, th the first three years, the next one they're going to extend, they have to see something substantial going on. Remember, <laughs> we are We've been drilling oil. I mean, we've started extracting oil for over a decade now, uh, Jifa. And we cannot boast up to 200,000, you know, barrels per stream day. That is very, very unfortunate. I know there are a lot of reasons that might be accountable for this. Of course, Talo had some uh, challenges with the tariff, uh, the, the tariff bearing. And then COVID also came to play. And if you remember also, Talo had issue with, you know, the court ruling and other things. So, of course, the aggregate of all these factors will say that it has fed into you know, why we are not able to achieve that target. But I think we've gone, I mean, we, we, we are far, far behind. I think by now we should have been targeting about 1 million barrels. But we are not there yet. Even the 200, we cannot. Okay. So that's why where I stand, I think that we have to make concerted effort. Let's keep bashing GMPC. That is an excellent to do. But let's not uh, say we should not make any attempt to do any investment. See, I, I, I acquiring access is an excellent thing to do. And like Ben mentioned, people are asking that GMPC, they don't have the state of art technology to do that. <laughs> you don't need state of art technology. I, I, that's why I go for acquiring the asset. See, when you have the asset and you are the major, majority shoulder, the beauty is you call the shots. Every employment, you have to take that. Uh, every supply chain, hiring, everything is done by you. And that's how can you control it. Talo is having a field, but Modet is the operator. Of, of course, they operate the e and I, I mean, they operate the, you know, the FPSO. So that's the whole thing. So that's why I think, I mean, acquiring the asset is an excellent thing. That is the only way. It is a panacea to take care of our destiny. 
However, the question that I've been asked, the issue of value for money, they are legitimate, and we need to keep hammering. Hammer to the extent that, but I, my fear is, I don't want it to hammer to the extent that we've, we, 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 we knock down the core mandate. I mean, we try to vitiate what our core mandate should be. So should we stop any activity in GMPs? No, we cannot do that. That's the only thing we have. So whilst we keep hammering for them to do the right, I think let's also make sure that we make concerted effort to retool GMPC. I mean, to make sure that they stay on their core mandate. And then going forward, I think the deal is just shadowed with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, you know, dark, dark portions. And I believe that there has to be involvement, detailed involvement. Because I don't, I, I, I can't fathom Ben saying they are going to uh, kick his upon. And KK Chapa also saying his doors are open. So the, the, I, so definitely some, something is wrong somewhere. No. But at the end of the day, they say if two elephants are fighting, it's the grass that suffers. Ghanaians need to, to maximize the revenue from the oil. We need to create employment opportunity. We don't have time. And I'm saying that this energy transition is not a myth. It is actually not a myth. It is a reality. Though I still believe that hydrocarbon resources will be with us, especially in our part of the continent. But the beauty is that if you look at how the attack is happening from both upstream and downstream, it is phenomenal. Upstream, a lot of, sorry, downstream, a lot of EVs are coming. <laughs> but like Don, uh, Ben mentioned, African continent, we don't have that infrastructure yet. And even the study was done, the amount of money that we need to catapult us into this transition journey is simply not there. And so that's how come some of us are calling the fact that let's invest into our world of hydrocarbon those who are very successfully into the in the investment into their world of hydrocarbon they are the same people who are very successfully in in the energy transition journey because at the, at the, at, at, at the end of the day sometimes the proceeds from the world of hydrocarbon is what you have to use for energy transition that's that's a fact and that's what is happening and that's why i'm saying that our part of the world it is the noc that is championing energy transition and they have a reason for that because gravitating from you know the world of hydrocarbon to the world of renewable renewable it's not like a click of a mouse it has to be about a concerted strategy where even you have to move through what you call decarbonization strategically before you can get to the green economy thank you very much and the problem is that um if if if, if, if you look at that's what i'm saying the reason why i say time is not waiting see esgs and the momentum they are coming you go to the capital market and the kind of infringement and the kind of bottlenecks that are going to put around where you are going to borrow, you simply tell yourself that it's better not to borrow. And so that's my point. I don't okay. want us to get to a point where we are asking ourselves, well, how did you get here? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Yes. Suleimana. And uh, we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll take uh, final comments from our studio guests and prepare for our next topic. Thank you very much for staying with us. It's hashtag the key points. You're welcome back. It's still the key points here on 3FM and TV3, also on DSTV 279 and also on 3news.com. And I guess the key points that we've gotten out of this whole discussion is that it looks like the valuation for this uh, GMPC acre deal is a bit on the high side. Uh, the other key point I guess we can uh, discuss is that we are unsure <coughs> of the uh, quantities below the seabed for which reason we'll be investing in, an, in a field that is exploratory. How about looking at a field that is producing and getting more out of that to do your additional investments? And certainly there is a need to engage civil society on what prospects are in this deal. But let me take final comments from our guests. Let me start off with uh, Ben Boachi. So looking ahead, what would you expect to happen? Do you want Parliament to you know, backtrack and say, look, maybe we need to take a second look at this? Or you would like GMPC to say, okay, we're going to do a bit more due diligence and come back? No, I think this has become like a national policy for government policy, right? So what do we want government to do as a responsible government at this point is to now look at GMPC and say, 
over the last years, we have given you so much to do what you are set up to do. All right, over a billion dollars. The responsible thing to do now is to ask what we have done with that and how giving you more will bring us value. And that is what civil society is saying. We have to do that needful thing of examining whether GMPC even has the capacity to absorb further investment from the state. That is fundamental. And then we go into the specific transaction that we are dealing with to see how we generate revenue if, you know, the justification is for us to continue with that transaction. How do we generate value uh, for the Ghanaian people through that transaction? We are saying that the market is not interested in oil investment, but the state is the one going to borrow from the market and give it to GMPC. What is the risk associated uh, with that? We need to interrogate all of this to be sure that we are not going back into that cycle. Because if you drop another billion into an inefficient operation, you will still come out with nothing. All right. The reason why GMPC hasn't been able to optimize the one billion is because they have simply been inefficient at spending on their core mandate, ensuring that they can learn by doing. And that's what we are saying, learn by doing. You have taken three blocks as operator. Go and drill. Get the service companies to guide you and learn from it. Requ recruit the right experts. The 600 people that may not be needed, that is not your focus. You have to really make sure that you are recruiting the people who can help you start your journey to becoming the operator that you want to be. All right? The HES block is not a stranded asset. It's not part of the conversation when you're talking about stranded assets. You have blocks that people are not interested in, you say, and you are sitting on it. You are not exploring. That is a stranded asset. You have to make sure that every oil that is on that block can be discovered as soon as possible in the interest of you know, that argument of energy transition. Otherwise, we are only uh, throwing in names and te terminologies to confuse the average person All right. uh, without dealing with the substantive issues. And that's what we think uh, ought to be done now. Let's right. do that introspection and position the company to do the right thing before you drop any billion into them. All right. Dr. Champong. Yeah, I mean, in, in wrapping thoughts. up, yes, I, I, like I said, specifically on this deal, some of the numbers need a bit more scrutiny. Um, the government says that they have got Bank of uh, say America or somebody to help Take them do that. Take a look at it again. Um, subsequently, when those numbers come, of course, we'll interrogate it. Um, and when the deal that they propose to bring back to Parliament, I'm sure we'll also get the opportunity to um, to interrogate it as well. Um, but the bigger conversation, in my view, really, um, back to some of the things Ben and you have said, is a, a bigger national conversation on what we want to see the oil industry in Ghana in the next 10 years. We've done the first 10. Um, what lessons have we learned from that, that position, positions us going forward for the next decade vis-a-vis -vis the transition? That, I think, we need a, a bigger stakeholder forum or dialogue to really dig deep on these um, set, set of issues. But as it stands now, I, I unfortunately don't even think that oil is the panacea to our development. Thank you. All right. And your final uh, comment, uh, Dr. Yusuf. Yeah. So thank you. I think I shared with, uh, uh, with uh, Ben and uh, Tio's uh, submission. First of all, GMPC has to be focused, really, because all these questions are coming <laughs> because of past history. But I always repeat that you don't judge, you use past history to say that, okay, we are not going to do anything at all. Let's fold our hands, arms and say that, no, we cannot do that. We need to retool our upstream. Our upstream is begging, you know, for retooling. And so, and I think this is one of the starting points. Let's keep hammering the numbers. And the beautiful thing is that this kind of composition should, should go on. And going forward, uh, Jifa, I think <laughs> GMPC, they have to involve the CSOs in most of the deliberations. I think they have beautiful ideas. And for all you know, I mean, we are all fighting for one country, which is Mother Ghana. If we save it at the end of the day, that is good. All right? So, but the kind of animosity whereby somebody says somebody is anti ghanaian or that, I think that will not aggro well for us. So going forward, let's keep on hammering to get the best out of the deal. Now, finally, what I want to say is that, uh, though it is a little bit tangential, see, we have existing players. Fortunately, we still have Talo and ENI who are still entrenched within our shores. And I think that's an excellent thing to do. I mean, that's an excellent thing to go. What I do know is Ghana, we have to be able to maximize 
our gas recovery in particular. Though this is, I'm saying this tangential, but I'm saying that because from my study, what I noticed is the fact that some of the reasons why we've not been able to optimize our production is because of offset issues in terms of our gas. So that's very critical. So going forward, government of Ghana, let's look at that. <laughs> Especially if you look at tallow fields, it is associated gas. So you don't get the oil when you cannot displace the gas. And that is key. All right. So that's where, where I'll end. Uh, I'll, I'll just end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suleiman. And it's uh, very interesting you brought up the gas conversation. And I think there will be an opportunity for us to really talk about gas because that's a whole different uh, uh, kettle of fish entirely. Yes. And, and I think that's something we need to do. We need to do. But I want to say thank you to our guest, uh, Dr. Suleimana, who is an energy analyst. Many thanks to Dr. Theo Achampong. And to you, of course, Ben Bwachi. Really appreciate that you've uh, put your expertise before all of us today. Much appreciated. And some of you have sent your messages already. Uh, let me take them. This one from Farouk in Tamale it says, seriously, the GMPC acre deal is another Ejapa family deal. Hashtag fix the country. This one uh, from Pake at Elembele says the GMPC acre energy issues, the level of secrecy in this whole deal is a matter of concern. In fact, I don't see this government doing anything extraordinary in the upstream and downstream sectors of our uh, oil and gas industry. The government is only benefiting from what the NDC government put in place uh, prior 